Be here now. Just be here now. I knew what kind of life I wanted. So it was really about intentionally living in the way that I wanted my life to be. It was being very mindful about the interactions that I would have or that I would not have. And this was how I met my, my now husband. I wanted to show up differently. And when I started to show up differently, different people started to show up and they were the I like that now, husband. Have you ever heard the phrase husband? A husband? No, I like that. I don't ever want my husband to be a husband, but he's yeah. my my husband. Now, husband. <laughs> husband. Hello, and welcome, friends, to the Creativity, Spirituality, and Making a Buck podcast with David Nickturn on the Be Here Now Network. My name is Michael Cammers, your host and monologist. It's a pleasure to be here with you, and we sincerely hope this podcast finds you as well as can be. Here at CSM, our guide, David Nickturn, discusses how to lead an integrated life involving spiritual practice, creative expression, and right livelihood with guests who embody and manifest these principles in their own life. We are very excited to share this discussion with you today. Our guest is equity advocate, author, and speaker, Erica Kidder, whose upcoming book entitled Black Mixed With, Finding Authenticity Through Adversity, will be hitting analog and virtual bookshelves right around the drop of this podcast. Erica believes that the vulnerable sharing of our stories is at the crux of creating environments of belonging and that helping others to embrace experiences of adversity and difference is the cornerstone to building bridges of empathy and connectedness. In her book and in this discussion, She details her transformative journey from being stuck in the limiting, culturally defined identity of a single black broke mother into an authentic life of resilience, belonging, acceptance, hope, intention, joy, and courage. In sharing her story, Erica strives to motivate us to accept our individuality, embrace it, and celebrate the diverse array of superpowers that are within and unique to each of us. We encourage you to learn more about Erica and pick up a copy of her book via her website, www.ericakidder.com. That's E-R-I-C-A-K-I-D-D-E-R.com. And while we're talking about websites, if you like what you hear on this podcast, we also encourage you to head to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash David to hear more of our content and BeHereNowNetwork.com in general to hear more great podcasts from the Ram Dass Network. Okay, that seems sufficient for our opening remarks. So without further ado, we present to you episode number 29 of the CSM podcast, Finding Authenticity Through Adversity with Erica Kidder. Enjoy. So welcome everybody to back to the podcast. And uh, in particular, welcome to our new friend, Erica Kidder, who's joining us today for the first time. And through a mutual friend who is our programming director, Rebecca D'Onofrio, on our Dharma Moon platform, Rebecca thought we would have a vibrant and uh, a meaningful conversation uh, with Erica. And... and uh, So we're going to launch. And first thing I just want to say is uh, welcome, Erica. Thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So first, let's just learn a little bit about uh, about you. Where are you? What part of the world are you in? So I am in, I'm outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I'm actually outside of Worcester for folks who are a little bit more local. So Northeast, that um, chilly Northeast weather, got some... We got, I think we got all kinds of weather today, right? We got snow and sleet and rain and wind all wrapped up in one. Um, so I'm in the colder part of the States. <laughs> yeah. Looking these, forward to it warming up. And there's these big dramas, the nor'easters coming. And then, I don't know, I'm I'm on the East River right now in Manhattan. Nothing. You know, it rained a little no, bit last in, night. I, and in Boston, it was it was the same. It was It was rain. Yeah. in Boston. Uh, the wow. further west you went, it was a little bit more of an event, um, but nothing that we couldn't, nothing that we couldn't 
Yeah. Take our way out of this morning. So, so, um, and what, what is your day to day looking like? Are you a teacher? Are you, what's your no, life? Like? No, actually my, in my day job, I am a senior project manager for an insurance company. Um, so that is my, that's my day job essentially outside of being a writer, which, which we'll talk about, but I actually manage, um, I manage teams of people in delivering software solutions for an insurance company. Whoa. So that's how I spend eight hours of each day. Yeah. And I think, I think that what's, what's nice about that, which we can also get into is for my project teams, I've really been focused on creating environments of belonging. And so that aspect of belonging and inclusion really tie into some of the things that I write about in the work that I do that I'm passionate about. Yeah. And you have a new book coming out and, you know, hopefully uh, if it's out in time for this podcast to broadcast, we'll include the information either way. We'll include the information because it's coming out soon and we want people to be looking out for it. And what, what is the book called? Sure. My book is called Black Mixed With, and it's about finding your authenticity through adversity. Oh, wonderful. Okay. Black Mixed With dot, 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 or with something specific? That's all. That's what it is. So the book is a rigid. So how do I explain this? Um, it starts off by being um, centered on the fact that I, I'm multiracial. I'm Black, Italian, and Puerto Rican. And going through some of the experiences I, that I had growing up and then um, more into what it was like to be what I co I coined myself the black broke single mom at the time. So becoming a mother, then a single mother and navigating my way through different circumstances and within corporate America as well and feeling a little bit isolated, seeing some discrimination, seeing the ways in which folks who are in a marginalized who are rep or an underrepresented group are at times treated and overcoming essentially the, the idea and the concept that you would be a statistic and really transcending that statistic, not only from a monetary perspective and from a professional perspective, but also in finding, going back to who you are in your roots and who you are authentically and really embracing the virtues and the experiences that make you, you and embracing those as your individual superpower and learning to bring that to the table and fully accepting yourself and really celebrating all that you are. That is so great. I know it's a lot. <laughs> no, it's a lot, but you know, um, well, you're a very articulate person, so it's clear as a bell. Thank um, you. And, um, it's also a journey that probably everybody's on in their own way. Yes. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to it. It's also, you know, uh, I'm from a previous generation, but it is the story of this country in so many ways. You know? it, it, real, it really is. And I wanted to, in a world that really focuses on attempting to box people in mm -hmm. or to help to classify people in order to make it make sense for them. Yeah. I really wanted to focus on bringing a narrative and a perspective around um, fluidity and around not as much the intersectionality of race or gender or social categorization, but around the intersectionality of experience and virtue and that diversity and bringing that to the table. Yeah. Wow. Well, you know, the, the, we play leapfrog in our community because topics can jump from creative expression to spiritual practice, to everyday life, to ordinary business, to raising a family. Uh, our, our platform is called dharmamoon.com. And sometimes I kid around and say, what's happening under the Dharma moon? The idea is that the, it's sort of based, you know, at the root, at the Buddhist teachings is the root of it. Uh, which are 
the, the, the essence of them is to try to see what's actually happening, what is actually so, what is actually true. So when we say Dharma, it's just actually could mean the way it is, you know, as it is, I call it, you know. So <clears throat> as that evolved, people can go the long way around uh, towards uncovering their identity um, or the very direct route is sometimes taken by some, some kind of teachers who just will go like, who are you? <laughs> and I just watched the whole documentary on an Indian saint named Ramana Maharshi. I don't know if you've heard of him or not, but no. he was, a, you know, an amazing uh, person who, who just, very early age, kind of dropped out of the whole cultural thing and really had some life-altering experiences. And his teaching centered around this question of who am I? He would actually put it that way. And he also supposedly was able to speak clearly to animals and, you know, very, very open field of uh, communication. But developing that kind of mindful attention to the question of authenticity and identity. So I'm curious if I asked, who are you? What would you say? Um, I would say that under everything and what I, what I know to be true, actually what I, what I wrote in my book of the first chapter, um, was, was my day two, which day two, I feel is when you know exactly who you're not going to be. Uh, what was day one? Um, day one is the day that you're born. Okay. And day two is the day where you realize that who you're not going to be. Wow. And okay. So, and that was, that was the statistic. That was the, um, what everybody thought I was going to be and the world's categorization of me. That's exactly what I'm not. And what I learned about myself was that I am a multitude of, I'm a multitude of things. And so I'm courageous. I'm incredibly resilient. I'm empathetic. Um, I am I am very loving. I am joyful. I am, I am happy. I, I am all, I am a, a mosaic of all of the things, all of the virtues that make us, us. And I'm also a product of my experiences. And those experiences have been incredibly valuable to helping to identify who I am as a person. Yeah. And I think that that's the story, as you mentioned it, of everybody. Yeah. Um, our experiences really as a poet. And I think that what's hard, what I, what I found what was hard about authenticity was I felt that I had to hide my experiences. I felt that my experiences brought shame. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I thought that, you know, like I said in the beginning, I, I, coined myself the black single broke mom. And people would say, why would you say that about yourself? Because now I wear it as a badge of honor, you know, because those were, those were the tough things that I went through that really brought me to the other, to the other side to love and accept myself for all of, all of what I've experienced and all of who I am. Um, but I think that the problem is that a lot of people find shame and hurt and and, you know, and it's hard for them to be vulnerable and to tell that story, but in being vulnerable and telling that story, you're actually building that bridge of empathy to connect with another person who may also be feeling the same way. They may want to hide who they are out of fear that they're going to be judged. Um, and I, and I really love actually sharing some of the things that I've been through or just being able to embrace people and to meet them where they are so that other people feel comfortable being their true self as well. So is this a structure used in the book of the days? Day one, you're born. Day two, you recognize uh, what, not, what you're not, not, or this is uh, improving right oh, now? No, that was, that was just, um, just something that, I, that I had written of, but the structure of the book really is by virtue. So each chapter is a virtue that I go through and explain so that by the end, 
Um, you know, at the title, I'm black mixed with, and by the end, I'm black mixed with not Italian and Puerto Rican, but I'm black mixed with um, resilience and acceptance and love and courage and joy and all of the things that make you you. And those are our soup. That's our superpower. So how many virtues are there in your book? For me, there's eight. <laughs> so the book has eight chapters? or Eight chapters, yeah. Ah, that's interesting. But I think if we sat down and thought about it, there are many, many more. <laughs> well, let, let's hear what the eight are. You just said so, four. Sure. So I have um, resilience. I have, now I have to go through all of my chapters, belonging, acceptance, hope, um, it's not you really intention, intentionality, um, joy and courage. That is, there's, sorry, uh, there's seven. I, ha I have eight chapters, but one is a, like a, a wrap up at the end. Okay. So seven virtues. Um, sure. and it's such a, a positive, you know, lately, uh, I've been, you know, as a Buddhist, you could look at it like some people think Buddhists are kind of nihilistic, you know, because they say emptiness and impermanence and all these kind of things. So actually, a certain amount of the Buddhist practice has to do with your second day, figuring out what you're not. Mm -hmm. And so even if you talk about um, emptiness, it's also talking about, uh, well, it, it, you're not permanent. Would you agree with that? I do. And the second one is you don't exist independently of other phenomena. You're interdependent from day one. And the third one is that, that and when you look for who am I, you know, the kind of core of the thing, you really can't find what uh, 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 a singular entity that you could okay. describe. So that's what emptiness means in Buddhism. Most people go, oh, they're so negative. They talk about emptiness like some kind of void. So, um, but lately I've been saying to people, you know, I mean, it's a funny thing to say at this time of life, but think positive. Why the heck not? You know, if you got a choice, you wake up in the morning and you think, well, this is, you know, you, you weigh yourself down with all kinds of anxiety and negative concerns. Now, if it can be genuine, obviously that's tricky because otherwise somebody could be just chipper and cheerful and un underneath that there's, there's some concern. But uh, you seem to be, I'm going to use the word ebullient. You know, you, you seem to be effusive. You seem to be so positive and you're energetic. And you're saying you earned that the hard way is what I hear you saying. I I believe that I did. I, I think that naturally I've always been kind of an internal optimist. I've always been able to see the silver lining. I've never, while I've had days and bouts of depression or things really not going my way, I don't think that I've ever been a person who really thought, well, this is it. I'm going to live and die this way. This is the way that it's going to be. I've always had the, the flicker of hope that mm -hmm. I'm going to, no, we're going to turn this around. It's, it's going to be okay. Um, but I think that to build on that and to keep that going, there's an element of finding that joy. And I think that in finding joy, really you have to find gratitude and you have to practice gratitude as, as a practice, mm -hmm. not just passively, but really um, focusing and making the joy and the gratitude intentional, I think is something that brings the internal optimism. Yeah. Making it intentional is an interesting point. Uh, it seems like intention is one of the things that we actually do have some capacity to shape. I think so. And I, I find that intentionality has really been, we can talk about hope and being hopeful and living in a hopeful place, but I think that intentionality is really the arc. It's really the part that is transformative a lot, you know, it's like, you can't, you can talk about it and you can think it and you can dream it, but without being intentional about your actions, even small things on a day-to-day -day basis, even something as small as the intentional gratitude, 
I think intention is where the shift comes in to really have that transcendence. And so what, uh, if you could, don't mind sharing what, you know, what obstacles you faced or some of them, what, where, where did you, uh, what was the sharpening, the wedding night, you know, the, the sharpening stone for your intentionality? Um, was there a time when you felt really like beleaguered or overwhelmed or overcome by circumstances? I mean, you I talked think- about being, you talked about being a, a black broke uh, mom. Ooh, there was one more. What was the fourth one? Black broke single mom. Single. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so I think that living intentionally really, it wasn't something that I said, I'm going to be intentional today. Right. It was something that over time I realized my actions be can be passive and we can be reactive or I can be I can be proactive and I can be intentional and I can do, I can, I have the ability to plan how I'm going to show up, to plan how I'm going to react, to establish my boundaries and to really control the things in which that I can control. Mm -hmm. And it was also, this might be a little bit, well, maybe not for you. It was also um, a bit of, you know, manifestation So I want, I knew what kind of life I wanted. So it was really about intentionally living in the way that, uh, in the way that I wanted my life to be. It was being very mindful about the interactions that I would have or that I would not have and the relationships that I would build with people or that I, that may not work out. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was about making sure that what I'm putting out into the world is, is worth, is, you know, worth receiving. And that, um, I wasn't going to, I I think about this and this was, you know, basically how I met my, my now husband, you know, I, I did not, I wanted to show up differently. And when I started to show up differently, different people started to show up and they were the I like that now, husband. Have you ever heard the phrase husband? A husband? No, I like that. I don't ever want my husband to be a husband, but he's, yeah. he's my my husband. Now, husband, <laughs> husband. Yeah, sweet. And 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 you have a, a, a child from previously, right? I have a child previously, and we also have a child together. She's beautiful. Two. Wow! Congratulations. That's so nice. And 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 who's the other? Who's the other child? How old is that person? Her name's Ava and she's nine. Nice family. Uh, you know, we um, sometimes, to me, the two places you spend most of your time, even if you're like a devout, intense spiritual practitioner and you do meditation and retreats, you spend most of your time at work and at home. Mm-hmm. And so those are always the testing ground of any kind of, if somebody says they have a certain kind of, understanding of life or the abstract quality of it you really want to follow them home and see how it's going uh (laughs) you know and uh it sounds like you have um created harmony uh around yourself but it's it's it is there still a sense of working towards harmony is it feeling that you just making the right choice in the first place generates a field of harmony or is it a daily thing to generate harmony and understanding I think that it's always, it's always a work in progress. I, you know, there's always something that I realize that we could have shown up better there or, um, you know, there's, there's a new practice there. I don't think that the journey is ever over. I think that I'm in a much better place than I was Mm. 10, 12 years ago. Um, but I don't think that the continuous learning is ever done. And I think that we are always evolving and we're always growing. And I'm always focused on how we can, how I can be better, how I can, how I can bring more, more harmony, more peace, more joy, less stress, less struggle, less, you know, less of everything that the world will have you have. Um, and where we can just a place where we can just be. And I think that part of that and 
and having that intentionality was meeting my husband who also has that same intention. So Mm -hmm. we don't have on the days where I'm not so great, he's like, you know, you are great. Mm -hmm. And we're working on this together. And, you know, there isn't ever, um, I actually, and it's something I always sometimes have to work on too, because there's never really a blame or, well, you should have done this better or, you know, that knit in that. Um, but I, sometimes I find myself maybe a little bit, um, post-traumatic stress, like, oh, he's going to be upset. Oh, what if it, and getting, and then talking, no, it's going to be okay. And then, and reframing those thoughts so that they're not giving you that negative anxiety and making you worry about things that aren't even there. It's not even there. It's gone. And do you have, uh, Eric, any kind of spiritual practice, any kind of meditation, prayer? What, what is your, we're, we're, if we start talking about, you know, your version of spirituality, what would we gravitate towards? I think that my, my, my spirituality is much more of a universal spirituality. I, I was raised Christian. I have a very, um, I have a lot of my childhood experiences are in the churches and in, in the deep South. Um, also my family, the other part of my family is incredibly Catholic. So very Christian based, um, but I have an appreciation for all spirituality and all religions. And I think that there is something meaningful and that we can take away from learning broadly about spirituality and about religion and practices. So that's more of my take. And um, as far as meditation, I'm not great at it. Oh, oh, that's, oh a, I know. <laughs> that's so sweet because, you know, I'm going to just refer you back to Rebecca to talk about that. She'll, she'll guide you through the Straits of Hormuz on that one. Yeah, that's uh, like somebody saying I, I don't want to study tennis because I'm not great at it. It's it's uh, <laughs> it's a it's a standard entry point for a lot of folks. Um, yeah, and what would it even mean to be great at it? It's just working with your mind, right? So you work with the mind you have. That's the whole premise of it. You work with the uh, emotions you have. You work with the life you have. So I think uh, you would know that pretty quickly. That that's not the uh, the thrust of it, the thrust of it is to make friends with your uh, situation, make friends with how your mind works. You're already doing a lot of this, just a a little bit of a tweak in a formal context of going, okay, as you said, I'm going to intend right now to work precisely with with what arises in my mind. And um, it's really, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't consider Buddhism a religion per se, um, because there's no articles of faith or belief or anything like that. It's sort of more ancient psychology and, um, you know, metaphysics in a way. So in the other part, though, there's the notion of um, who's around in the big picture around us. Are there saints? Are there angels? Are there teachers? Are there um, gurus? Are there teachers? Are there spiritual guides? Uh, Are there friends? Is there a community of people? Uh, How do you visualize what's around you to support your journey. Is there any sense of that? From a spiritual perspective? Yeah. Yeah. I believe that, um, that there is a spiritual afterlife. I do. Uh, Okay. I I believe that strongly. (laughs) Other people probably may differ. Um, but I, I do believe that. And if it's not a spiritual afterlife, I feel that there's an energy, um, and I feel that there's that there's an energy that works for you and on your behalf and in your timing and that all of those things may not be what you wanted it to be, but ultimately it's what's best. And um, that divine timing is the right timing. Yeah. You're a Jedi. You use <laughs> the force. The force surrounds. Yeah. So, um, Leaning towards aspiration, uh, when when somebody like me meets somebody like you, I say like, where where would you like to see it head for you? I see things, uh, uh, you know, uh, coming towards you. 
How about work? Is this work that you're doing, do you see that as kind of like the, something to develop further or something a parallel journey might be taking place? So you're starting to write a book, so you'll be talking to people, you'll be communicating maybe as a teacher from that pr- platform. W- what do you see? I don't exactly know what my my professional, professional title, my day job and how this all goes together. Um, I know that what I bring to the table to my teams every day is that I create environments of belonging and acceptance. And for people to, if at, if you feel nothing else coming to work, you feel a sense of community when you're on my team to be able to, um, to do your job, to stretch your skills, to feel empowered, to, you know, take that risk if you want to do that thing that you thought that you might not be able to. And that's all, that's all good on my, on my team and within our space that we can develop each other and develop us as a sense of a team and us as a sense of a community. And I, love bringing that every day with the people that I work with. I think that it's essential to people in the workplace to have that space where they feel that they can grow. Um, as far as my, my book out, outside of that, um, you know, I really would hope that I can be a motivational speaker. I hope that I can continue to write whether it be a second book or blog, you know, blog content, I hope to be able to do that. Ultimately, I am looking to create a platform that is focused on inspiring people to be inspiring and, you know, mostly um, women and women of color who may not have the same representation of every that other people have to inspire them to really show not only are you not the statistic, but you can transcend the statistic. This is all that is here for you. You don't have to live in a place where there isn't any representation. We see you. And I want to lift people up in that way. And I don't, it's funny, I don't know how these two things play together right now. Um, but I'm excited to see what, what is in the future, because I think that they can play together. I I think that they can. Yeah. So I saw a motivational speaker, you know, um, when we started talking about it, um, and that's a blossoming field too. It's interesting that there's, um, Obviously, it's a stark field. You know, people have been doing that for a long time, but that it's linked up with the kind of, uh, you know, let's say more new age or more well-being, holistic approach. Uh, it's now becoming, I call it the new record business because, you know, I worked in, I've worked in the music and entertainment business along with teaching Buddhism for the last, you know, 45 years. And one is starting to look a lot like the other in terms of like people with a kind of certain voice, a certain perspective being able to make a certain presentation. And um, <clears throat> if I had a label, I would sign you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, you. You know, and we will be expanding. I know over, you know, right now, the Dharma Moon is really kind of a very roots. Uh, you know, we're, we're really digging a lot from the depths of the Buddhist perspective because it's, uh, it's still fairly new to a lot of people and people are dr- drinking off the top of it, you know, just sort of getting mindfulness or some, some, you know, more s- surface level experience of it. But at the end of the day, there's a need for people who can flip or transform somebody's energy. It's shamanic really is what it is. And can you, can you take, a lot of us, I think these days are trapped in a kind of downward spiraling, anxious, stressful, negative. Uh, it's historic. It's karmic. Uh, it might be individual. And it can't be just overcome by like, hey, put on a happy face. You know, that that kind of level of the new age thing is um, you know, maybe too superficial. But somebody who's really undergone, which it sounds like I, I love the platform of your uh, um, 
Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, you're multi-ethnic, which is, um, you know, I used to say to people, Eric, go to Singapore if you want to see what the world is going to look like in about 2,000 years. Everybody in Singapore is a blend of ethnicities that has already gone through a cycle. So it's almost like a different kind of species. <laughs> and, you know, that's a very interesting aspect of your story to me, anyhow, um, especially as a New Yorker, by the way. Uh, because that's what New York's all about. And then uh, the, the, the single, broke, black mom is, I could just see saying those four words and a whole very large swath of people go, what, 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 what did you say? Are you talking to me? And, and uh, you know, your your positive energy is so genuine it's like almost startling in a way because against that backdrop you see so many people who are either faking that or or wishing you know wishing that it was so or really starting to sink into muck and mire we call these the dark ages it's like and they were prophesied hundreds of years ago that the world was going to go through a cycle of loss of heart uh loss of harmony loss of balance and um that's also a Phoenix time, you know, when people can rise up and, and really meet the challenge of the situation. So do you, do you have an idea for your second book already? No, I don't have an idea yet. I, I don't. Um, I, I wish I could give you something, you know, phenomenal to rattle off on the top of my head to say, yeah. this is what it's going to be. And, and I don't, I don't know. I need to just, I need to just go on the journey now yeah. and see what I, and see what comes next. Um, but I just, when you had said about the black broke single mom, again, it just really resonated with me because ultimately that's who I wrote my book for. Um, you know, I, I, I wrote it for me as the black broke single mom. And I wrote it for the other women that are in that situation as well. And just saying, you know, it doesn't have to end up like that. Like that's not, I know that that's what the world will have you think, but there is so much more to you that, that how they're trying to classify you. And I mean, that's, and that's just one way that the world tries to classify a certain type of individual, but there are other people that are going through the same types of challenges with a different name on them that, they're looking for the other side too. And I well, feel like really it's the story of everybody. You know, a, a, a composer friend of mine said he would go in for a job. You know, we had to write a score for a movie or so. And he would meet with the client and he'd write on the blackboard, good, cheap, fast. And he would then write, pick two. Not going to get all three. So if you just put those four words and said, pick one or two of them, it's almost the entire, everybody's been broke. Everybody's been single. Right. Everybody's been some kind of mom or dad <laughs> or had one. It's uh, very universal threads there. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I have no doubt at all in my mind, because uh, this is, this is part of what I do for, for my living is I meet with people like you and we talk and we go, hmm, what's, what's taking shape here. And it could, it could mean just sharpening up the, uh, the sense of working with one's kind of core equipment in the, in the mind and how to, which is sort of the meditation aspect. It could be like, Oh, did you, you, you just dropped this thing over here and that's a jewel. And you just kept walking, you know, the creativity aspect. And then the livelihood thing, which is framing out, um, how do I connect the dots there? So, um, you know, you're, you're, it's good. You're taking one step at a time. A lot of people get ahead of themselves and that's not healthy. Actually, you can have a vision, but if you start walking too fast, you, you, you're going to lose your thread. So tell us a little bit about your kids. Sure. So my daughter, Ava, she's nine. Um, she is in the third grade. She is the, I feel like she's just mini, she's mini me um, <laughs> in many different ways. I, I saw her upstairs uh, organizing her closet one day. And I was like, people would dream of this to have their nine-year-old like organize the closet. 
<laughs> but I'm like, oh gosh, she's just like me. <laughs> so, um, and the baby, her name is Lena and Lena is two and she is, we like to call her too wild. Um, she <sighs> is very much independent mind of her own marches to the beat of her own drum and her word right now one of her favorite phrases is my do which Mm. means she's going to do it my do so anything that even hold her hand can i no my do hands off hands off (laughs) so uh she can be a little bit um challenging sometimes because she has that kind of personality where she has a one track mind of what it is that she wants to do. And she's solely focused on that. I joke around that she's either going to be a CEO or an inmate. (laughs) (laughs) You can be both. These these days it's really easy. We're hoping, but we're hoping for not inmate. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. We had um, a few gray hairs getting there. We have a, a, a meditation company in Japan called True Nature. Lovely group of people um, been studying and practicing together there. And, you know, two of the principal people have two kids. And one of them is the, uh, this kid, Eddie. And he was about five at the time. We had a conference and we're all, and he's somehow at the head of the table. So his nickname has been CEO <laughs> since then. Yeah. It's interesting how quickly the, the flavors come out of, of kids. I've got a four-year-old granddaughter named Izzy. And I don't know if you're following, but this storm is named Izzy. Did you notice that? This hard, no, this, I didn't. Yeah, this is uh, it, it, this, this uh, nor'easter that we just got in, is called Izzy. And she is a little hurricane. Similar. There's a, there's a very strong energy there, you know, and um She's not looking back, you know, like a lot of kids, they look up. How, did you see me do that? Did you, did you, did you feel that? Just wow and go. Is that, is that what she's like? Yes. She's a very uh, strong energy and she is, she's a light though. Mm-hmm. Like she's just, she's a beam of light. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just, it is so interesting and beautiful to what to watch not just her but both of my girls together um it's really been one of the parts of the pandemic that i practice that intentional gratitude because i think without that it's possible that i might have missed um in the busyness of the day and being away at work and then being at school we may have missed some of that really beautiful connection um, that they have to each other, that they have to us and that they feel so, so loved and and safe in the house, in our home. Mm -hmm. Um, That it's something that I have noticed and grown to love. And one of the things where I really focus on when things get challenging or it's hard to be in quarantine in the house or we're not able to to do the things that we want to do or they're just being kids. And sometimes that can be challenging in itself. It's nice to remember and to see um, that the the light that they have and Mm. to appreciate being in that present moment with them and to not miss it because it really is palpable. It's a good reminder. Uh, Now, you know, everybody knows out there that we're in the middle of a a life altering global experience. What's been, what's been your experience tied to COVID? How have you how have you processed uh, the last couple of years? What's what's changed? What what insight do you have to share? When COVID started, uh, Lena was only five months old, mm. and so now she's two. So mm. that's a what we and my husband and I talk about it all the time. We have the same challenges as others. I think that. Um, one thing that we've been incredibly grateful for is that our Um, careers were not impacted. We were fortunate. So when people talk about, well, we're all in the same boat, 
I don't think that we are all in the same boat. I'll just put that out there. You know, I'm saying what I'm what I'm grateful for. And I was fortunate. Not everybody has been as fortunate as we have. So we have really um, been thankful and appreciative of that, of being able to work in the home um, and of not, you know, having some of those same challenges that others have had. So you, and, you can do all your work at home? Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah, that's very fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, so we were very fortunate there. So we always um, remember that we were lucky. We were lucky to have that outcome. And the other thing that really helped us was, like I said, really watching the girls and being present enough to, you know, drop the news, drop the negativity, kind of block out what's going on out there and really focus on the our home and what we've been able to build together, which has really brought a lot of love um, and that we've been able to see and feel firsthand. And the other thing that we always talk about and make sure that we're, you know, we're always saying, oh, imagine if we missed this, we were able to see so many firsts and Ava was able to see and witness firsthand so many firsts of Ava, of Lena, you know, walking and crawling and talking and all of the, all of the little things that I'm pretty sure the daycare providers saw before I did, you know, and just mm -hmm. waiting to see, did she notice that? Like she says that word <laughs> You mean because you were working at home because, because when of you're working, COVID. right? So when you're working outside of the home, you know, you miss those things. And I remember sitting in meetings and feeling like I'm missing it. Like I'm missing, I'm missing her first steps. I'm missing her crawling. I'm missing, you know, the first time she ate peaches, I'm, I'm missing it. And I'm just hearing about it secondhand when I go and pick her up at five o'clock. And by the time I get home, she's exhausted. I'm exhausted. I'm not getting any of those things. And now in the world that we live in, while it's challenging and, and while it's, it can be incredibly depressing and daunting, um, I choose to focus on the things that I get to see now and yeah. ha having that quality time with my family. So in a sense, it was a positive thrust towards keeping you all at home and 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 being with your daughter in her earliest uh, years. And otherwise, that would have been harder to to navigate that. So that's yeah, an interesting I, twist because a lot of people have experienced increased uh, vulnerability and stress, and um, you know, marriages have been strained by it, families have been strained by it. And it's not to say that those things aren't there. The challenges are still there. I still live in a house. You know, we were still in the house for just as long as everybody else. You know, we still have our own challenges. I know I'm no peach to live with. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm sure I, I sound great, but I'm human like everybody else. I'm sure that I have some quirk that gets on my husband's last nerve. And so, um, you know, we still have all of those things. But again, it it goes back to the intentionality of what you choose to focus on and what you choose to let go. Mm -hmm. And we, at the end of the day, choose to focus on being present and seeing these beautiful moments in our home and with our girls. And we choose to let the small things go. Mm -hmm. And that's really been what I believe has gotten us through the pandemic because it hasn't really been, um, you know, it's, it's been different and mm. unprecedented and life-changing for so many people and mm. in so many ways for us as well. Mm. What are some of your hobbies? Um, besides writing? Yeah. We, so uh, we like to travel where we like to eat and we like to drink wine. So <laughs> less wine now because working on being a healthier version of myself going into the summer because summer Erica would, would like to wear uh, a nice bathing suit. So. <laughs> so there's, there's a borderline on the wine. We're striking the balance where yes, you yes. can't see we have the. <laughs> uh, anybody cook? We do cook. 
Um, My husband took the girls out so that we could chat in peace here and picked up some salmon. And so we've been focused on making some healthier meals because like I said, we're trying to get Mm -hmm. into the the balance. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in the, uh, you just sound like somebody who's optimized the present situation to, to a degree that's a little bit unusual, you know, I'm going to just say. So that capacity to optimize without 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 buying into any kind of, um, you know, superficial manipulation of the situation, like avoiding anything difficult, is um, definitely something to share. And uh, if you can kind of get it, the recipe for that, which you're sort of working on, I can see you're working on the recipe because you could cook a great dinner for somebody, but you could also give them the recipe. It's two different things. So um, how about uh, any other creative outlets um, like music or dance or anything like that? No, um, not not recently. One of the things that I talk about that is near and dear to my heart is that I used to act. Ah, um, okay. So I haven't, I haven't quite found how to get back into it, how to get back on stage, how to, how to do that yet. But I think that, you know, potentially in the future, maybe, um, and always, always looking at, um, and, and awe really about how people communicate, um, the expressing the human condition. Yeah. So that is, that's kind of the thing that is in my heart. So. You know, we're probably the only species that I'm aware of that you go through a whole day, you live your life, you make your moves, you, you do your work, you have relationships, you have, and then the first thing you can think of doing at the end of the day is let me watch other people do that <laughs> on, on television. <laughs> but haven't you had enough of it for one day? No, I want to see how other people do it. You know, and um, I just finished watching. I mean, obviously, I'm I'm a musician, so I'm always curious about people's creative process. But there's this Beatles documentary um, called Get Back. And now the first 20 minutes of it is them peeling off maybe um, 20 of the best songs you've ever heard in your life at from any time, any place you go. I mean, for me, I as a songwriter, I'm going like, what was going on there that they could hit it that hard, that consistently and t- t- turn that out. Then it goes to this kind of backstage aspect of how did they work together trying to get um, how to get um, their two weeks to put together an album that and writing out of scratch. And so much of that was what most people would consider dysfunctional interaction. You'd think, oh, I got a great idea. What about you? They were just like really misfiring and kind of making it was frivolous. And there was a lot of rough edges to it between the people. And then at the end, they get up on the roof of uh, a building in, in this is 1969 in, in London. And they play a live concert with the songs that they that they created there. And it's just like after all that chaos, this thing came together, uh, which, which was kind of jewel like in a way. You know, so um, that processing, um, I think a lot of people could get lost in that. And I've seen it a lot in the entertainment field where people get lost with the negativity. And for example, maybe people who like were a great songwriting team or a great acting team, they can't even talk to each other ever again. That funny twist? Yeah. So how can you take a process that has some tension, some conflict, in it that ends up creating great beauty out of that um it's it's um it's challenging and i think i i feel like for us you you want to um if somebody's ride is too smooth you want to introduce a little chaos factor you know and if there's too much chaos you want to like you know see if you can pencil in some more harmony and sympathy and empathy so um and we're here, I'm convinced we're here to just share journeys and share stories. I think so. And, and storytelling is really important that way. But it is funny that we live our lives and then we watch a sitcom. 
<laughs> goofy in a way. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So um, let's 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 just let everybody know about your book and let's give it a really good solid plug. Um, this sure. is Erica Kidder, everybody, and she has a new book coming out called Black Mixed With. And it is about finding your authenticity through adversity. It's a good, it's a, it's a great pitch. And we think we expect it to be on Amazon. Expected to be on Amazon. And I expect it to come out today. We're in January, January 17th. Um, I was hoping that it would be out by now, but I am waiting for the pre-ordered copies to be printed. And once they're printed and shipped, then it will be available on Amazon. So I am hoping February. Okay, February, which is just around the corner, probably. Around the corner. And we will let everybody know if the book is out. We'll let you know where you can get it. We'll send you a link, but otherwise you can just look for for that title. Um, And do you have a website? I do. My website is www.ericakitter.com. And Eric is with a C, right? Erica with a C. Okay. Yes. Kidder is the usual way. Two Ds. K-I-D-D-E-R. We are not kidding. Okay. We're kidders, but we're not kidding. We're and- kidders, but we're not kidding. It wasn't, um, it wasn't, we didn't really think about it, but we were engaged on, we got engaged on April, April Fool's Day. And so we were so happy to just be engaged and, and go make dinner reservations. And we were in New York City, actually. I got engaged at the Brooklyn Bridge and that's where my husband proposed to be as I um, love, I love New York and I went to film school there and just, I want to go to the, you know, so he brings me to the Brooklyn Bridge and surprise, uh, will you marry me? Yes. Let's make reservations and go out for a fancy dinner. And probably like three or four restaurants thought it was an April fool's joke. Like, ha, 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 ha. like where, the reservations where, where, where did dinner. you end up going? We're just kidding. And I were like, no, 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 we're serious. Uh, 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 uh. And where did you end up going? Oh gosh. We, we went to SDK at one point and we did have brunch way downtown and I wish I could remember the name of it, but I can't. I do remember that it was a lovely brunch and it was this like terrace. It was this garden almost like thing appeal. And I wish I could remember the name of it and give them a plug as well, but I cannot. (laughs) Well, I'm going to throw in my two cents. If you haven't already started, you know, motivational speaking just plug a module into your website and uh you know it's very inspiring to talk to you erica thank you 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 have such a lovely flow and energy about you and also uh, you know all the things you're talking about you're manifesting and that's really rare so thank thank, you thank you so much for coming and visiting creativity spirituality and making a buck and i wish you big success in all three topics Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. There you have it, folks. Episode number 29 of the Creativity, Spirituality, and Making a Buck podcast. Finding Authenticity Through Adversity with Erica Kidder on the Be Here Now Network. I agree with David. I found that conversation very inspiring. And we sincerely hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as we enjoyed making it. If you would like to hear more podcasts, please head to BeHereNowNetwork.com slash David. Speaking of Be Here Now, we'd really like to thank Corey, JR, Sarah, and everyone there for their hard work and commitment. If you'd like to study with David and join us in community, please head to DharmaMoon.com. We always have lots of programming up. Every year we run several mindfulness meditation teacher training programs. We have a Foundations of Mindfulness program for people who don't want to teach but want to move deeper into the practice and many, many other offerings. And certainly, we also encourage you to please head over to ericakitter.com to pick up a copy of Black Mixed With. And so until next time, we wish you a fond farewell. May you be safe, healthy, happy, and at ease and meet all that arises on the path with wisdom, compassion, and authenticity. All the best.